Uh, so our speaker today, many of you may already know him, uh, Rabbi Michael Weinstein. Weinstein or Weinstein? West Weinstein. Thank you. And uh, he's been at the temple here in Tulsa since 2018. And I understand that your wife is the cantor at the, at the temple. So he has a program that he calls Ask the Rabbi. So I suppose that means it's open to questions, but we're so delighted to have you. Welcome, Rabbi Weinstein. Thank you so much. So first of all, good morning. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's interesting. I stood off to the side of listening to your normal Sunday morning program. And it sounds and feels very familiar. No one really knows what's going on. There's always food involved. <laughs> Some things go across all cultures and all faiths. So I'll just take about two minutes to kind of tell you my story a little bit, how I ended up here in Tulsa, because I know I've had different people asking me. And, and then, well, we'll see where our time goes. I understand I have about an hour, is that right? Maybe a little less? What time are we, what time's our hard cutoff? Thank you. If, so there's the old joke about 1045. Yeah, that was quick. We're already finished. So there's the old joke about when you see a rabbi or a minister or a pastor walk up to the podium, take off their wristwatch and put it down in front of them. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> So actually, I do have a clock here, and I will try to be cognizant of our time. So I'm Rabbi Michael Weinstein. I have been here in Tulsa since 2018. Um, I'm not quite a Tulsan or an Oki yet, but I've really grown to love being in this community. As you all know, it's a fantastic place to be, a hidden gem in the middle of our country. Uh, born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, undergraduate work in Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati. I've got a degree in philosophy and another in Jewish studies. I went on to do graduate work at Xavier University in Cincinnati, a nice Jesuit institution, with a Master of Arts in Christian Theology. Then I went on to rabbinical school at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, where I achieved a Master of Arts in Hebrew Letters and ordination. I also have then gone on to receive and achieve certificates from Boston University in professional fundraising, so we can talk. Um, and then also Duke University in uh, nonprofit management. So these are all things I realized that after all of those years of school, there were things they didn't teach us in rabbinical school, like how to be a modern rabbi. Um, so. That's kind of my background a little bit. Yes, my wife is a cantor, and she and I work together uh, at Temple Israel, and we are really enjoying the work that we're doing, and we're very privileged to be able to do so. So that's a little bit of my story, a little bit of my background. I have a 17-year-old son. I should say we. We have a 17-year-old son, a senior at Jenks, and that is an interesting, interesting experience with a uh, teenager, it's amazing because on one hand he's incredibly smart, very bright, very kind, and on the other hand he is just a dummy. <laughs> you know, he just he, he can't see beyond the end of his nose, and on one hand he gets these aha moments every day, and on the other hand I just shake my head and say, get out of your way, get out of your own way, and there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm, I'm at, at that point in my, my fatherhood, and uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, ask the rabbi. When I was approached to speak to you, I was, I was, I was told, oh, just come with a grand topic. <laughs> right. So I thought I would open the floor to all of you and we'll come up with some topics and questions that are, are of interest to you that we can unpack together. But before that, in the Jewish tradition, it's, it's very common to begin a meeting of any sort with a bit of study, a bit of learning. We are called the, the people of the book. Which book? All of them. <laughs> there is learning to be drawn from everywhere. 
Um, a little bit of background on where I'm taking you in just a moment. Think back in your history of religion, back to the first century. In, in your tradition, there was a historical character walking around, teaching Torah, being present for people. You know who I'm talking about, Jesus, right? About that same time, the year 70, is when the temple in Israel was destroyed. Up until that point, Judaism was what we would call a cultic religion. The way in which we offered praise to God was through sacrifice. You would raise the best of your first fruits and your grains and your, your harvests or your unblemished pretty lamby lamb, and you'd bring it three times a year to the temple in Jerusalem, offer it up to the, the priests, the Kohanim, the descendants of Aaron. They would throw it on the altar, that wonderful smelling smoke, that roasting lamb would go up to God and everybody would feast, and that's how God was worshipped. At the fall of the second temple in the year 70, that began a new era of Judaism, which is what we call rabbinic Judaism. And that's because without the temple, there was no place to bring your lamby lamb for the altar. And worship moved from sacrifice to prayer and song. And that's when, well, over the next two, three hundred years, the rabbis of that time period began to write down questions and answers. How do we do X, Y, Z? How do we offer, offer um, prayer? When do we offer prayer, et cetera, et cetera. And this was written down in a uh, series of what I guess you would call volumes called the Mishnah. The Mishnah was then the rule book, if you will, for the next uh, 300 years after that. So somewhere around the year 500, there were responses to those early questions, which came about in the form of the Gemara. The Mishnah and the Gemara together make up the Talmud. Has anyone heard that term, Talmud? So the Talmud is a conversation across generations. You've got first century rabbis being questioned by third century rabbis who are being corrected by, 15th cent by fifth century rabbis. And really what it breaks down to is the job of the rabbi. My job is to interpret the tradition for this generation. When I walked in, some of you uh, mentioned to me that you have a relationship with Rabbi Charles Sherman. Uh, rabbi Sherman was the rabbi of Temple Israel for 37 years. His job was to interpret Judaism for that generation. And we look to the previous generations to see how they approached issues to make decisions upon the world today. So that's a long way of saying we're going to study a little bit of Talmud this morning. And I don't necessarily have enough, but I didn't intend to. I thought we could share. So. Another rule of mine is you don't read ahead. <laughs> that also translates all religions, doesn't it? So this, this piece of Talmud you'll see at the top of the page, I was nice enough to bring us a translation. So you'll see that there is a text from the Babylonian Talmud. There are actually two Talmud the Babylonian and the Palestinian. What would the difference be? Anyone? <clears throat> yeah. So Babylonian Talmud would have been the rabbis discussing the issues of how to live outside of the land of Israel in Babylon. The Palestinian or Jerusalem Talmud, which is not followed or studied as much, it's not as common, would have been the rabbi's interpretation living in the land of Jerusalem during that time period. So we have a piece of text here from the Babylonian Talmud. It says Ketuvot, which is the volume. And the Ketuvot is a discussion on legal documents. A Ketubah, has anyone heard that term before? Is the marriage license. So before a Jewish wedding, the first thing we do is sign the Oklahoma marriage license because we have to be legitimate. And then the couple will sign the ketubah, which is a Jewish marriage license. It's an agreement. Basically, you know about the vows that happen under the chuppah or, or, or at the altar. This is in writing. I agree to do X, Y, Z, and, and you agree to do X, Y, Z. 
Originally, going back to the time of the Talmud, the ketubah would have been a, uh, a business agreement between groom and father of the bride. I agree to give you X number of goats for the, your daughter's hand in marriage. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> but needless to say, the tractate ketuvot is a discussion of legal issues and legal documents. So buried in that long volume, you can see this is from page 62A. There's A and B because, frankly, it was a different way of numbering pages then. So let's look at this for a moment. When Rabbi Yochanan, a portly man, was ascending a staircase with Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi supporting him, the step he stood on began to sag under his weight. Are you picturing it? You've got the older portly rabbi ascending the steps with his two disciples next to him. And you see the step begin to stress. So he climbed the remainder of the staircase rapidly by himself, pulling his two aides with him. The sages asked him, since your strength is so great, why do you require support? Why did you need those two, uh, those two disciples to help you up the steps if you could have done it yourself? Rabbi Yochanan replied, Otherwise, what strength will I have left for Torah in my old age? Mmm. Sage wisdom. So, let's have a bit of a discussion for a moment. What's the difference between the aides supporting Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yochanan supporting his aides? Is one better than the other? What are the benefits to the old guy being supported by the youngsters? Moving forward, okay. Respect. Respect. In Hebrew, we say kavod. Of course. That's all you got? <laughs> okay. Mentoring. So you're, you're, you're taking this physical example and making it metaphorical. Very Jewish of you. So... <laughs> Knowledge, yeah, yeah. You know, we have the imagery of, of the disciples sitting at the feet of the sage, right? Learning from them. So now flip it over. What are the benefits? Or the, what's, what are the, what's the, uh, yeah, what's the benefit of Rabbi Yochanan supporting his students? Interaction between generations. What was that piece? Wisdom. 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 So think about it in your own lives. When are we to support one another and when are we to look for support from others? You may not have a forward answer, but I'm going to give you something to think about. How do we define strength? How do we define strength? Ability to face adversity. That's lovely. And Kathy and Hank, you were so kind to, to share your words of thanksgiving to the group in advance. And your gratitude was for the strength you received from your community. And that was beautiful. Thank you for doing that. So why did Rabbi Yochanan choose to devote his strength to Torah? How do we understand? Well, first of all, do we know what Torah is? That's the literal translation. Yes, the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. We also, that's, that's what's called the written Torah. We also have a tradition known as the oral Torah, which on one hand is that Mishnah, Gemara, Talmud, all of that other Jewish learning, interpreting Torah, interpreting the tradition. And one might even say, and this is where I use a lowercase t in Torah, it's all of our learning, and it's, it's everything that we bring to, to Jewish life. So, why did Yochanan choose to devote his strength to Torah? I feel like we already shared this in a roundabout way. Give me a little, give me a little more. Where are you going? Well, chewing on the word. I mean. Chewing on the word. That's a translation. That's an interpretation, isn't it? <laughs> so, where do you devote strength in your own life? 
whether it's your time, your wisdom, your energy, your focus, your money, family and your church, your community. Right. So what I'm hearing, I never heard anybody just say, I devote my strength to myself alone and only me. You provide your strength to, your, to the world around you, to the others, and you draw strength from the world around you, from the others. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. So that I kind of answers number four as well, so I'll skip it. So let's... Thank you, first of all, for allowing me to do a little bit of teaching, something for you to think about. Before you turn over to the back side, <laughs> should I have you raise your hand if you did that? <laughs> Let me find a marker. What I'd like to do is make a, uh, a to-do list, because I love to write a to-do list, and I love to scratch things off my to-do list. I actually am one of those people that will recopy a list with things already scratched off <laughs> so that I feel better about myself. So ask the rabbi. Some of you already kind of approached me and said, I've got some ideas and some thoughts. So, so that we don't repeat, let's just do a bit of a brainstorm. What are the, some of the, of the topics? What are your burning questions? What do you know? What, what do you want to know? And we'll make a list. Sir, Mike. You went right to it, didn't you? <laughs> so you're, you're talking about uh, engagement of younger generations. Yes, I am. Within the context of, of the media, of everything that the kids see today, from TikTok to mm. You know what? I, that, some might say that's the million dollar question. <laughs> I imagine so. What other burning questions do we have? Why are we having such an increase in anti Semitism? Mm. Let me find a different marker. What other topics might we want to touch on? Yes. That's not a small question. I know, I know. Yes. The Jewish community in, in Tulsa has been so strong and so, you know, supportive of everything in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see that continue? Is the community growing? Is it not growing? Mm. Yes. Personally? Oh, okay, okay. I'm having trouble writing today. Question, but the Lord's Prayer, you know, is that yeah. a good Jewish prayer, a heresy, or a revolutionary, or do you want me to leave the room? <laughs> That's a good question. Yes. What's the Jewish belief as it relates to uh, abortion, right to life, right to choose? Abortion. I'm glad I've asked instead of just brought stuff because the things that I prepared for are not on this list. <laughs> we're, we're called the challenges. That's fine. That's fine. I love it. Yes, sir. So you're asking me to kind of give an overview of denominational Judaism. Okay.
Okay, how much time do I have? <laughs> is that clock correct? That clock is correct, okay. Um, do I ask for any more? No? no? Did you hear what she said? She's, she said, well, let's see how you do with these. I'll warn you. My first job out of rabbinical school was probably the hardest job I have ever had. And I, I taught at a Jewish day school for eighth grade Jewish studies. I learned how to throw chalk and markers. <laughs> so, Let's hit some of the easy ones first. Younger generation engagement. I sense that we are having the challenges across the, the, the world and it has nothing to do with, with what tradition or religion we are. We are all from a certain model, a certain brand of Americanism, for lack of a better term, where your church, you have a model of, of how you how you engage and the things that you find of value. And you walk around going, well, where are the young people? Why are they not coming around? Is that, is that fair? Yeah, same thing at Temple Israel, same thing across the country in terms of our congregational involvement. It's not that we don't have young people. They just have a different understanding and different set of values that frankly I've aged out and I don't get it either. But what I'm realizing is that some of the work that we're doing at Temple Israel, I just brought on a young rabbi, I call her a baby rabbi. She was just ordained in May, married two days later. Um, we brought her on to be our engagement rabbi, specifically to target the 20s and 30-somethings, to figure out and ask that question, what do you want out of your Jewish life? What do you want out of your spiritual life? Because they're not coming to worship, they have no interest in stepping in the building. But what we're finding is these young people, and there's a, and they might tie into the Jewish Tulsa question in a moment, but there's an organization that's been created over the last three, four, five years called Tulsa Tomorrow. And what that is, is there were a handful of Jewish leaders that were sitting around dinner one night, and they've been friends for, you know, 40, 50 years, and they were complaining because their grown children left Tulsa to go off to college and didn't come back. Does that sound familiar? And now there are grandchildren huh, that they're not seeing. So this was entirely out of self-interest. They said, what can we do to get our grandkids here? They have nothing to do with their children anymore. <laughs> and so these, these wealthy uh, movers and shakers, they each said, you know, I'll throw X number of dollars into the coffer and let's, let's let's do something about this. And they did some fundraising, they tapped into the George Kaiser Family Foundation, and Tulsa Tomorrow is a recruiting effort to bring young Jews to Tulsa to build a community so that those certain leaders can have a community for their grandkids to grow up in. And I think that over 50 different young people have, have moved here to Tulsa uh, they bring trips. They don't pay for them entirely to make the move, but what they do is they sponsor trips to come and meet Tulsa. And the last time was during Oktoberfest, so they were able to, you know, see the excitement and the energy that we have here and the things that a young life, a, a, a young person has to, to engage in here. And we're trying to build that community. So this young rabbi of mine, uh, my baby rabbi, who's exhausting, She's so full of energy. I just, sit, I just sit back and I'm just like, oh my God. But she's creating opportunities because what we're realizing is Jewish young people want to be together. It's a common language and this taps into some of these other things that we're talking about. It's, it's about being together because we don't have to explain or defend and you can just be. So there are Shabbat dinners that they're having as pot potluck dinners in people's homes or, you know, uh, my young rabbi's got a, a, a trivia night coming up at a local, uh, one, of the, one of the breweries downtown, and it's just an opportunity to bring people together. So 
they don't want the same things that we want necessarily, but they do want a community and a culture. And my hope in the back of my mind is if we can engage them where they are, they're going to need things like a rabbi to marry them. They're going to need things like Sunday school for their children when they begin to have those grandkids, right? Um, and maybe instead of trying to stick a square peg into a round hole, you know, make them fit into our model, we can mold our model to their needs as time progresses. So that's my hope. And I'm just kind of throwing, what do they call it? Throwing parts at the car to see what fixes it. For these young people, in many ways it is. In many ways it is because um, there's a term that I like to use, and you may, you may understand it as well, SBNR, spiritual but not religious. Those people that find God on, in, on the mountaintop, in the sunset, at the beach, and they're not interested in coming to church. They're interested in community. They're interested in a, uh, a sense of strength from something bigger than themselves, but they don't want to do it the way we've always done it. And, that's, and that's, that's the challenge for me interpreting the tradition for this generation is what do those rabbis from 2,000 years ago inform me about how to approach it today? It's, it's a very easy task. <laughs> no. So, oh, of course, of course. And actually, that's a nice segue into this question of anti-Semitism. And it's, it's a complex question. How do we approach it? What does it look like? You know, when I'm working with a student and a, a, an individual comes to me and says, Rabbi, I want to convert to Judaism. I have an initial, I don't want to call it intake, but an initial conversation with them. And I teach, first of all, that in more traditional Judaism, capital T, first of all, we don't proselytize. We don't seek out the convert. And we have not for 2,000 years. That might explain why we've got such a small population. Um, that being said, when someone comes to the rabbi, traditionally the rabbi is supposed to turn them away three times, and not necessarily nicely. Um, why do you think we would be charged with turning a person away? Not once, not twice, but three times. Yeah, looking for a true or, or, a, or an impartial or a pure intention. That's exactly right. So I've never slammed the door on someone. I've never turned them away that way. But I do sit with them and ask some really difficult or poignant questions to see if, if the intention is pure. And one of the questions that it's a, I call it a hypothetical question, is why in the world would anyone want to become part of a people who've been hated for thousands of years? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, sometimes I, I get a weird, interesting, brilliant answer, and sometimes I get silence, which is what I really expect. But yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised into a tradition that has in many ways been hated for thousands of years. When I was in my master's program for Christian theology, I spent a year, um, one of the courses I took was an extended year-long course entitled Healing Deadly Memories. And the first semester was a look at Christian scripture as a basis to anti-Semitism. The second semester was a, a modern 20th and 21st, was it 21st century yet? And well, it's like 2004, so we were barely into the 21st century. But it was a, a modern look at anti-Semitism as it's been promulgated and promoted and supported throughout modern history. You know, and I'll give you some very basic examples, and it's all about how a text or a tradition is interpreted. Um, when I was in undergrad, I remember a professor for Dead Sea Scrolls taught me a very interesting, valuable piece, and that was on the question of translation. To translate, he'd say, you are a liar. To not translate, you are a thief. So when we are translating text from Greek, from Hebrew, 
we lay our own agenda, we lay our own understanding or interpretation upon it, and if we don't translate, we're stealing someone else's idea. So the question is, how do you get to the actual truth? Well, truth is an entirely different discussion. But what am I getting at? I'll give you an example um, from the Christian scripture, Matthew 23. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Heretics? You hypocrites? Does that ring a bell now? Look, look at you hypocrites. You're wearing the, the prayer shawl and walking around all pompous as if, as if uh, you know everything. Or um, This is my own interpretation. And that was a foundation that was, a, that was for many, many generations a source of anti-Semitism to say that that, that tradition, and we're talking about first century Judaism, we're not even talking about anything that's modern today, but that was one approach to how hate was built through misinterpretation or misunderstanding of text. So, anti-Semitism today. I just did a text study uh, with my, I've got a, a, an adult learning class that meets every Thursday, um, and we were looking at an article that discussed Kanye West. It's in the news today, right? And we weren't necessarily looking at what he did or didn't do as much as some of the stereotypes behind that anti-Semitism that are continued to be that are continuing to be supported today. Um, things like the Jews on all the media. Sorry, I just heard worship. That was kind of nice. <laughs> so. Let me, let me touch on that for just a moment. And, okay, let's try this. What do you think the population of Jews in the world today is? Give me a percent. What percent of the world is Jewish? Anyone think 5%? 2%. Two percent of the world's population is Jewish? One percent? One percent of the world's population is Jewish. Remember, we have about what? Last I heard, somewhere around seven and a half billion people in the world. So less than one percent. Anyone think less than one percent? Less than one half of a percent? So the world population, Jewish population of the world is roughly 0.02 percent. 1939, the world's population of Jewry was somewhere around 12 to 15 million Jews. Holocaust took 6 million lives, 6 million Jewish lives. Just in the last decade did the world's population return to that 12 to 15 million as a result of the loss of 80 years ago. So there's somewhere around, I'm going to go heavy, 15 million Jews in the world. Now what percentage of America is Jewish? 10%? 20%? 5%? 5%? Hmm? You think 5? 3? 3%? 2%? 1%? Actually, it's about 2.5% which means in every, let's see, I'm not a math, I don't do math, I'm a rabbi, but let's see, two and a half percent, so that would be five out of every 200 people are Jewish. I did that because it's weird to say two and a half out of every 100 people. <laughs> What's well, a half a person? But so under three people out of every 100 are Jewish. They control the media, right? Yeah. They control all the money, right? I mean, I'm making sarcastic remarks here because some of the, the anti-Semitic thinking out there is absurd. However, there is some grounding to it. Um, Jews are good with money. Have you heard that one? That's a result of history. During the Middle Ages, under Moorish rule, Jews were not allowed to own property, land, anything of substance, they became money lenders because that's the only thing they were allowed to do. And that has perpetuated as, as, a, as a result of immigrant culture. 
Um, speaking of immigrant culture, Jews control the media. Come on. Two and a half percent, really? However, Hollywood, those early original moguls that went out to the West Coast to this foreign desolate land and created what we now know as Hollywood were all Jewish. Why? Because they were unable to be successful on Broadway because they were Jewish. They were all immigrants. All they wanted was to acculturate and assimilate into American society to be like their neighbors down the street. So they moved out to California where they could not be Jewish, at least not traditionally Jewish. There are videos of the Warner Brothers, for example, having Easter egg hunts on their front lawn <laughs> because they wanted to be like the people down the street and they were not able to do so. But uh, Metro, Goldwyn, and Mayer, nice Jewish boys from Brooklyn, <laughs> Warner Brothers. Um, yeah, so you've heard of the Academy Awards? The Academy of Motion Pictures, the Motion Picture Academy, was founded by these moguls because they wanted to pat each other on the back for their movies. And it was a way of saying, oh, good job on this one. And that's how this has evolved. Um, so that might be the touch into media. Um, also, as a result of immigrant culture, there's a value in the Jewish world of education. First of all, I already gave you a, a, little, a little taste of it because we're the people of the book. And we value learning. We value asking questions. One of the, uh, the foundations of Judaism is not only are we able to question, we're challenged and charged to ask questions. Um, a little Torah, a little Bible for you. Remember back in Genesis when um, Jacob is traveling and he's down in a creek bed and he comes upon this stranger. Does this ring a bell? And they begin to wrestle and they're fighting back and forth. What's my name? Give me a blessing. What's my name? Give me a blessing. He pops his hip and he says, oh, fine. And the stranger, stranger, an angel or messenger of God, or some believe may have been God, gives him the name of Yisrael, Israel, right? The word Yisrael means one who wrestles with God. We are by Jewish DNA supposed to wrestle and challenge and ask questions and get angry with God and find meaning in questioning. We have a whole holiday about it, which is Passover, where we are taught to give our kids the opportunity to ask questions. Why is this night different from all other nights? You know, why on this night do we eat different kinds of foods, et cetera, et cetera. So we're charged with finding the truth. And an immigrant culture, anyone, would want to enable their children to progress and succeed much further than they ever could, right? And in the immigrant culture where people come to America with nothing, they promote education because it's a means of giving their children a leg up. So that's kind of where the value of education comes from, is we just want more for our kids, and we see it in other immigrant cultures as well. Um, I don't know if I addressed the question of anti-Semitism. Hate's a nasty thing, and hate comes from ignorance, hate comes from misinformation, and opportunities like this to just get to know people of other, other backgrounds is how we work around that. Uh, I do a lot of work personally in interfaith, um, in my volunteer time, well, let's frame it this way. All of you come to the church when you're not at work, when you're not doing those other things, because this is a place for you to volunteer and to feel good about what you're doing and give of your resources, your skills, your time to something you believe in. Same thing in the Jewish world. Our, our people come to the temple to volunteer and feel good about themselves. If I were to, in my free time, go to the temple to volunteer, what am I doing? I'm working. So, actually, I, I have found that I have a specific set of skills that I can give to uh, law enforcement chaplaincy. So, I'm a Tulsa Police Department uh, chaplain. Um, I'm a chaplain for the United States Secret Service. I'm a chaplain for uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement. And it's a way for me to use some of my skills 
to give back. What it also does is provides a Jewish fo voice in a non-Jewish world. Um, that's part of my job is to advocate for the other, whether I'm the other or someone else is the other in our midst. You know, we are charged as Jews, as rabbis, to uh, be the voice for the widow, the stranger, and the orphan. And I'm, I use those terms a little loosely to include what I call the capital the capital other, because there's always the other in our midst. So let's, uh, let's keep charging forward. Have I run out of time? Oh, that was only 10, 15 minutes. We're doing great. Salvation. That's an easy one. No, it's really not. So salvation. How do we understand in your tradition salvation? First of all, let's start there. What is salvation? So all you got to say is, I believe. In the word saved. Basically, isn't it defined as to be saved? So that could mean any number of things, being saved out of a drowning situation. Redeemed, healed, saved. Redeemed, healed, saved. Anybody else want to add to our, def our definition of salvation? Excuse me. Well, it, it, you know, right you. sacrificing, you know, Right. Okay. Okay. That's a great piece to add. And ma'am? I would say forgiveness. Forgiveness. Mm. So, several years ago, before moving to Tulsa, I was serving a small congregation in small town Virginia. It was about 50 miles outside of D.C. And I was the only rabbi in about 45 miles in most directions. I, I joke that the Going to the east, the next congregation was in Cordova, Spain. <laughs> um, but I would often be that voice of Jewish life. And I sat on an interfaith clergy group, and we'd have lunch together and learn together, and I suddenly one afternoon realized that we were all speaking the same language, English, but the use of the words carried a different understanding. And I, I came to this realization with the word redemption. When my Christian colleagues were talking about redemption, being redeemed, they were talking about salvation in Jesus. Would you, would you disagree with me on that? When, when you hear the word redemption, you go right to salvation through Jesus, right? When I use or hear the word redemption, I talk about freedom Freedom from enslavement, freedom from those things that bind us. Redemption happened at the Red Sea. That is a very different understanding. So it's use of language. So let's talk about salvation for a moment. In Hebrew, the word for Savior is Mashiach. Because there is a, a messianic ideology in Judaism, which I'll explain in a moment. Well, I can explain it now. According to traditional Judaism, the Messiah will come riding on a white steed through the golden gate of Jerusalem. And at that time, the world will be redeemed using that Hebrew or Jewish understanding of redemption where we will be freed from that which enslaves us, which could be pain and hurt and anger and all of that other stuff that comes with salvation, right? So that's a very traditional approach. Well, first of all, the Golden Gate of Jerusalem has been bricked up for hundreds of years. There is also an Arab cemetery on the outside of the Golden Gate, which was put there intentionally so that the descendant of David riding on that white steed, who's a Kohen, a descendant of the priests, could not enter a cemetery. Hmm. So that idea goes out the window, right? But let's talk about a modern liberal approach to a messianic idea, and that is a messianic age. We as Jews believe in the idea of what's called tikkun olam, repairing the world. And theologically speaking, 
Well, first of all, the, the first verse of, of Torah, the first verse of uh, Genesis, does anyone know what it is? Say it like you mean it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? I don't like that translation. Even though we all know it, every tradition knows it. A better translation is when God began creating the heavens and the earth. Active tense. Instead of in the beginning God created, that means the creation happened once and it was done. You know, that's the theology of the watchmaker. The watchmaker takes the springs, the gears, the hands, the face, puts it all into the casing, winds it up, and lets it go, right? When God began creating the heavens and the earth. In our tradition, we understand every day as a renewed creation. And it's a partnership between God and humanity. So we have to do the work of acts of loving kindness, of good deeds, of advocating for the other, the stranger in our midst, because we need to make it better. Only once we make it better will an age of messianism come. So we're not talking about a descendant of David riding on a white steed entering the city. We're talking about an age, um, sometimes I say back to a utopia or back to the Garden of Eden. That's the ideology, but it's, it's incumbent upon each one of us to do the work in partnership with God. So, Mashiach, Savior. The Septuagint took the word Mashiach and translated it to the Greek Christos. You've heard that term? And that's why you have this character of Jesus the Christ. That's, an, that's also my, uh, my translation as well. The actual name would be Yehoshua ben Yosef Umiryam. Joshua, the son of Joseph and Miriam. Jesus the Christ. So how do we understand salvation? I've already kind of given you that little piece about a messianic age and doing the work to make the world better. How does that differ from a Christian understanding of salvation? I jokingly said all you have to do is believe and then you're all like, oh, whoa, 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 wait, it's not that easy. What are we talking about? What is the means to salvation in your tradition, in your faith? Good deeds? So well, actually we're doing the same thing, we just have different, there's more than one way home, right? Absolutely. Any other questions on this idea of salvation before I move on? Yes? Are we, are we saving ourselves in this act? Explain saving ourselves. Well, I'm not putting my, my bad deeds on you. I've got to address them myself. Mm. This is a road map. It is. Very difficult. Yeah. So, how do we understand sin? And I'm going down a rabbi hole here like you have no idea. <laughs> how do we understand sin? Missing the mark. Did you all learn that somewhere? We've had rabbis before. Yeah. Missing the mark. Yeah. So, In Judaism, we have the, one of the biggest, well, the biggest holiday is Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement. And Cheshbon uh, HaNefesh is what we're charged with questing during that time period. HaNefesh is, is uh, your soul. So in the biblical period, you often read in, in Torah, in Bible, about so-and-so laid upon their heart, X, Y, Z, that believe the heart was believed to be the, th the center of thinking. They didn't understand about the gray matter. So the heart was the center of thinking. So I'll give you an example. Deuteronomy 6, 5, moving forward, you shall love the Lord your God with all your 
with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. In all of your heart. All of your nefesh. All of your might or your strength. So let's talk about this for a moment. Levavcha, your heart, that's your thinking center. Nafshecha, your nefesh, your soul, I call that your gut, your, uh, your kishkis. Your, uh, anybody watch the show NCIS? It's been on forever. <laughs> the Gibbs character, Gibbs gut, that's the nefesh. He trusts his gut. So you've got your thinking center, your, your emoting center, and then meodecha, your might. Me'od in modern Hebrew means more. Me'od, me'od, more, more. So really, you're thinking, you're feeling, and more. It's with all you got, right? So, sin. Cheshbon ha-nefesh. When you're in Israel and you go to a restaurant, at the end of the meal, you want to get the story of the meal, right? That's what my father-in-law called that paper they bring you at the end of the meal. The story of the meal. It's, it's the bill, right? The check. It's the cheshbon. It's the assessment. Cheshbon ha-nefesh is an assessment of the soul. It's the tally of the soul. And every year around Yom Kippur, we do a cheshbon ha-nefesh. Who have we harmed? Who have we done bad things to? How have we harmed ourselves? And we are to ask for forgiveness. It's a day of atonement. And we've got 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur to do that work. But it's not enough for me to say, God, forgive me for the sins I've done. I need to say, Mike, please forgive me for these things, X, Y, and Z, that I've done against you. I hope you can take my forgiveness. If Mike chooses not to, that's on him. But I've done the work of asking for forgiveness. Thank you for being the victim. So I've done the work asking for forgiveness. Only after I do the work from man to man, human to human, am I able to ask God for forgiveness. Does that help to, to understand? So there's accountability. We're accountable, accountable to ourselves. We're accountable to others. We're accountable to God. And some of you are going, well, that sounds a lot like Christianity in some ways. Again, it's not so different. <laughs> I think I'm moving pretty quickly through this list. Are we out? Well, We're out of time? Church starts at 10, at 10, 11. So, so, so wait, wait, wait. Let, can I take three minutes to talk about the abortion question? Because somebody's shouting at me. Abortion's a tough, tough question. There's an idea in Judaism of two Jews, three opinions. I'll let that soak in a moment. So there's not one yes or no. Remember, we are charged with challenging and questioning and asking everything. So abortion. One of the strongest values meets vote, is the term in Hebrew, is pikuach nefesh, preservation of the soul. We are allowed to step over the line and break other rules if it's going to save a life. But how do we understand the idea of saving a life? Is it the medical? Is it the physical? Is it the mental, emotional, the psychological? There are many different aspects to the ending of a life. And it's not as easy. Nothing is ever as easy as black and white. I mean, I'm certain if I were to ask all of you, and I'm not asking because that's one of those hot buttons, but pro-life, pro-choice, there's a... Uh, Spectrum, even within that, because it's not so simple. You know, if, if there's a, a mother-to-be who is pregnant, but for some reason the birth of this child could cause harm or irreparable damage to the woman's life, should we complete the birth? If it's going to cause the death in order to give life, do we complete the birth? Do we use it for recreational purposes because we're, we are uh, irresponsible? Personally, I would say no. 
It, it's, it, that's, that's not a good reason. So it's not as easy as black and white and what does Judaism say, because Judaism will say 50 different things. But I think we'd find that same thing in this room in your own opinions. So I know I didn't directly answer your question, but I hope I got you a, a little bit of... I mean, that's the way we approach a lot of issues within Jewish life. Um, anyway, oh, this is an easy one. This will take two seconds. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, how will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is that it? That was your question, right? Yeah. Is it a good Jewish prayer? Why, why were you anxious to ask that? You know, uh, Rabbi Fitzerman came and talked to a Bible class mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. He gave a long, wonderful description of a Jewish prayer. Mm -hmm. Part of what you argue. And, and mm -hmm. So Jesus was a good Jew. It's mm -hmm. a good prayer. Mm -hmm. Let me try it this way. So that is the prayer called the Kaddish. The Lord's Prayer is a translation of Kaddish. So it's a very good prayer. It's a very good Jewish prayer. It's a prayer about life. Um, it's a prayer that we use in, in several different forms. One is on every worship service at the end. We, there's a version known as Kaddish Yatom, which is, literally translates as the orphan's prayer. That's when we recite the names of loved ones who are deceased, who are, we are remembering either on the anniversary of their death or for some other meaningful event. Um, so how do we remember loved ones in our lives? We say their names, we tell their stories. So that's at the end of every worship. There's also Kaddish de Rabbanon, which is a Kaddish for our teachers, and there's extended parts to it. Um, but yeah, it's a good prayer. My friends, we got through a lot of this list. We touched on that, we touched on that, we got through that. That's not bad. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Have a great morning. Wonderful. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Don't forget to turn in your name tags, and whoever wound up with the tray, please bring them back. And yes, I'm wearing purple again. <laughs>